Um, we continue in today's uh, service with the word. I want you to go ahead and just speak to God and ask him, Lord, open my eyes to see, open my ears to hear. There is a word that you have prepared for me and I don't want to miss it. Go ahead and declare that distraction is removed. Declare that your heart is a fertile ground for the seed of God's word to be sown this morning. Declare that that word is mixed with faith in you and it produces tremendous results. Declare that the entrance of God's word gives you light and understanding. It unravels mysteries to you. Nothing is permitted to confound you because you have a sound mind. You have an excellent spirit. Declare that your spirit is the candle of the Lord and the Lord this morning ministers to you showing you what needs to change that the holy spirit reproves he corrects he encourages he instructs this morning enabling you to attain that height that god has determined for you causing you to be fruitful and to abound in good works declare that that word as it comes forth this morning will lighten up your life and it will be oil causing your face to shine in the name of Jesus. Would you go ahead and thank God for the sure word of prophecy that he has prepared for you. That you are an active partaker. You are an active participant. And that you take your place at that table. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Father, we thank you. Because the anointing that makes the teaching and the preaching of your word easy. It comes upon me afresh. The anointing that makes the hearing and the doing of your word easy would rest upon us all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we, um, if you've been with us here at LifePoint for the last couple of weeks, you would have been familiar with the teaching series, Tad, Follow Jesus. Can we say that together? Follow Jesus. And we've had different people just come teach us so brilliantly and expound this word in our hearts. Today we continue in that same message, the last part of the teaching, before we then start a new teaching series from next week Sunday. And I want to please implore you, don't miss church in the month of March. Help me tell someone, don't miss church. I'm going to keep a seat for you beside me. Go ahead and tell them. That you will keep a seat beside. Some, of you, some people are afraid to make that commitment. Because even you that you are saying it, you are not sure that you will be in church. Tell them, there will be a seat for you. Just in case you are, you are afraid to, to commit. There will be a seat for you. Don't be missing. Let your space not be missing. Let your space not be vacant. Alright, so today we are going all the way with Jesus. We go all the way. We go all the way. And I want us to read together um, our general reading for today. Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to 39. Romans 8, 35 to 39. If you can, please have it up on screen. Otherwise, just open your devices. All right, let's read together. Can we have the new King James Version, please? NKJV, thank you. NKJV, quickly, quickly, quickly. Band, I already told you guys to please have your mics. We're going to do some singing as we go along, yeah? Once you go, we're going all the way to 39. Once you go, who shall... I need you to read it with a lot of confidence. We've had breakfast already. That's why we do 10 o'clock service. We're not doing 7 a.m. service. So you've eaten. The assumption is that you've eaten, you are well fed. Let's take it together. I want to go. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. Thank you. We are accounted for the slaughter. Yes. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, 
nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Let me start out by saying something that we underestimate. As God's children, we underestimate the very real and present danger in following Jesus. And I know that sounds shocking to someone, but it's the truth. And we want to spend time to, this morning to, ex, you know, to just examine some of these things that deter us from following Jesus. A lot of mindsets that we have and dispositions, mental dispositions that we have, you know, taken on as people who even just exist in the world, first of all, that prevent us from effectively following Jesus. And some of us perhaps have excused away these dangers and these issues. We have either joined the herd thinking around some of these things, or we have simply just refused to be bothered anymore. Why? Because he's giving shackles. We're going to examine some of them, but it's important to underscore this first point that I have mentioned by helping us recognize the kind of world that we live in. We are all not oblivious to the goings on in our world. If you are doing business, you know what it is like to do business in current Nigeria. If you ex exist, or even if your business is cross-border, you know the real challenges that exist. The uncertainty, the complexities, the ambiguities, you know, the very volatile operating environment that we exist in. If it's in Korea, corporate Nigeria, I mean, I was having a conversation with someone, I think it was on Friday, just around the losses that some of the multinationals are declaring. Guys, have you been seeing them? It's ridiculous. They're not going to pay dividends this year, most likely. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to call names here, yeah. but if you've been following the trends, whether it is balance sheet loss, so, because we know some of them, they have their ways. What they are saying to us is not, it's not, it's not exactly what is, you know what I'm talking about. Uh -huh. So whether it's a balance sheet loss or it's an actual loss, because some of them, you know, the nature of the activities, uh, it's very import dependent, and we know what the rate, the, the dollar is saying right now. There's a lot happening in our world. That's the summary. There's a lot happening. But regardless of these things, how do we posture as believers who are following Jesus? Because everything in and around is screaming, are you sure about this follow where you they follow? Are you sure about this person you claim to be following? Are you sure he's worth it? Because it's all not adding up anymore. And these are the mindsets that are militating against us. Real conversations happening on social media platforms these days. And people are questioning the authenticity of God's love, the efficacy of his word. And guess what? We, the so-called believers, are also doing the same. Either directly or indirectly. We fail to realize that there are certain dispositions we take when we give up on his word and give up on his promise, by implication, we are questioning the authenticity of his love and the efficacy of his word. We are saying, in, a, in essence, that God, I don't think you are who you say you are. I'm not sure that these things that you have told me is for real. I'm struggling. And so we're going to address those different things. I have here this for entry or exit ways. Yeah, just permit me and go along with me. If I had my way, I would have created proper doors to explain these points. But just see them as exits, and these exits represent different things. So looking at that scripture we read in Romans 8, 35, it says, who shall separate us? This was Paul the Apostle here speaking. Who shall? He had gotten to a point in his journey that 
Nothing else mattered. And he says, who? And it's interesting that he starts to then describe things. Every time I read that scripture, it occurs to me that it is usually a who. Whether it is a mindset or an agenda being sponsored, it is a who. It is the enemy at work. You know how it says in scripture, the enemy has done this, right? Whether it is trials and tribulations, whether it is, you know, things happening, people, governments not functioning the way it ought to, there is usually a, a sponsor. There is a sponsor. Tribulations, distress, persecution, whether it is persecution, there are people at work. A, a, a famine situation, nakedness, peril, sword. Then it goes on, it says, I'm persuaded that neither death nor life, angels, principalities, powers, you know, it starts to categorize the various who's that exist in our journey to deter us from following Jesus effectively, to prevent us and to cause us to be in that state where we are constantly questioning the promises of God, questioning his fatherhood, questioning his love, questioning everything. And it's okay if you have come to church this morning or you've joined online and you are filled with questions. Because one of the things that I know God will do for you is to answer those questions. That's why we prayed about the word that we were going to receive. Because it is a word for you. It is a word for me. Preparing for this message, I was, you know, just all over the place in my mind. Thinking thoughts. You know, it, it, the work started with me personally. Because that's what I always pray for. That I will not just be here to tell you what it says as a vessel. But that the work would also be done in me. That my faith will be built up. That the Holy Spirit will open me up to the areas where I have been blindsided to. And I have been shortchanging myself in the process. So as in life, so it is in our work with God. We experience delays, potholes, distractions. You know, traffic jam, or as we call it in our, in, in our local Nigeria, or gridlocks. We experience these things and other forms of obstacles that deter us or try, attempt to deter us when, we, you know, when we're on a journey. But how many people have got into a pothole, you know, going to work? You've got into a place that has a pothole and you have turned back, except the road broke into two. You say, ah, today I'm not going to work, oh. Why? I'm calling my boss. Boss, there's a portal on my road, so I can't be at work today. Or you get into a traffic jam, right? And you say, ah, this traffic. I know we've turned back, oh, let's not, that one is even, that one maybe is not even the appropriate example. Sometimes you just go back home. Depending on, the, on how serious the journey is, you're going to the mall, or you want to go and hang out, you want to go and watch a movie, and the, the traffic, you look at Google, the estimated time of arrival is looking like three hours for a 30 minutes journey. Like, man, bro, I'll see you later. You go back home. But depending on the priority level, if you're going to catch a flight, amen, you have bought tickets. <laughs> you have bought tickets in this economy. <laughs> Lagos, London, three million naira. You know, I was telling somebody, I said, my very first Lagos, London trip. Maybe it was like 50K or 100K max. Like 3 million naira. Please, it's, and it's not first class, it's coach. If you're not careful, beside the toilet. <laughs> because you want to do a six hour journey or six and a half hour journey. So you have bought that kind of ticket. And then you now hit uh, mainland. And then your Osho, the uh, expressway is blocked. What will you do? <laughs> there you are. You look for the nearest available bike with your box on your head. You will get to that airport. Nothing will stop you from getting on that plane. Nothing. But you see, take that and approach. Because that journey is important. Our walk with God, our journey with God, our journey to the desired destiny, the defined destination that he has promised us is even more important. But what happens? We see and we experience these obstacles in our way and we give up. We cut short the journey. We pause it. The assignment of the devil and his agents is to distract and to deter us from following Jesus. Simple and short. Everything militating against you and I eh, in this world is to prevent you from following Jesus. The day you said, I do. You know, you say I do to Jesus, right? 
Ah, you don't know. When you say, Lord, I give you my heart, you have said I do. You have entered into a relationship. He proposed, you accepted. You have married him. Are we together? That day, eh, is the day the angels and the agents, the agents of, devil, of the devil, they rise up and say, this one, you will not, you, that journey will not end well for you. This Jesus, he said, you want to follow. <laughs> Each and every way, we will cause you to question him. And do you know how we know? Aside from every, all, I mean, there's so many examples in scripture. When Jesus created the first, first man and the first woman, who showed up on the scene after a while? Oh yeah, now guys, you read your Bible. The serpent showed up. Who, who took the form of the serpent? The devil showed up. In that place of perfection, no. In that place where nothing was amiss, the enemy still found his way there. When Jesus went on a spiritual journey for 40 days and 40 nights, who showed up after he finished? Yeah. So that says to you and I that everything the devil is doing is to prevent you, is to distract you, is to, what other word, borrow me the synonyms, to ensure that that heaven, you will not get there. This Jesus, you will not enjoy the benefits of knowing him and of being with him. He doesn't even want you to be with him. He wants you to continue to question his love and be in that place of constant doubting. Be in that place where you are completely separated from him because that has been his primary agenda to isolate us from God. And the question to you and I this morning is, are we going to let him win? That's the question you and I need to answer. Are we going to give the devil room to win this battle? Or are we going to follow Jesus all the way? Matthew chapter 24 verse 12. It says, the New Living Trust, it says, There will be such an increase of the sin of lawlessness that those whose hearts once burned with passion for God and others will grow cold. It says, The love of many, some of us know it in that translation, it says, The love of many will wax cold. Everything that is happening is in line with scripture. There's nothing that is happening in our world that, we've already, that has not already been foretold in scripture. Everything that is happening is in line with scripture. The sin of lawlessness. Iniquity will become rampant. There are certain things that happen in our world right now that if our parents are wondering, my goodness, is this, is this, still, is this the world? Because in their day and their age, and I give, give you examples, technology has made it so easy. Technology is an enabler. Technology that was inspired by the wisdom of God, you know, to solve problems. It's the same too, and that's what the devil does. He's not an original. He's not a creator. There's no bone of creativity in him. He simply takes what God has done. He takes the truth, and he spins a lie out of it. He will go to the, to the woman in the garden, and he will say, did God say? And that's it. Always sowing seeds of doubt. There are questions that you and I have today eh, that we need to check well. It might just be an agenda being sponsored by the enemy. There are questions in your heart. You say, did God say? He will go to Jesus. He will say, it is written now. You can just turn these stones into bread. Jesus will respond to him again and say, it is written as well. Man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus was able to defeat him because of the abundance of the word in him. He keeps sponsoring thoughts. He keeps sponsoring agendas. The book of Revelation repeatedly speaks about those who overcome till the end. So it's not enough for us to get saved. The question is, what is that journey looking like? And how are we faring on this journey till the end? Those who will overcome till the end. That is the mandate that we have. So people exit following Jesus for different reasons. I was talking earlier about what technology has done and how it has made even sin very easily accessible. Very easily accessible. Back in the days, if you want to engage pornography, you have to go and buy a magazine. All the old people here, you please respond. We, we are young, but we've been told by you guys that if you have to engage pornography, you have to go and buy a magazine, right? You have to, but now you are not buying nothing. It's right, it's right here. You can just engage a site. It's right at your fingertips. I remember my, first, my very first relationship in uni. 
You know, I, I wonder, sometimes I look back and I wonder how we, how we survived. But we survived, though. We really did survive. Because then it, it was letters. Yes. They'll come and look for you in your hostel. They'll drop a message for you. We will find out. I'm like, we weren't calling ourselves and all that then. But we were meeting up. How were we doing these things? Communication was, it was stronger then, I guess. The, the sense of community. On like this day and age that everybody's just, you know, the deception of we're all on social media together. You know, some people have family members on social media. Your family, your tribe, they're on social you've never, you, you've never met them. And it's the beauty. It's the beauty of technology, right? But you feel so connected to them. But you've never seen them. You've never even spoken to them. I remember I, I have these three friends. And we've been friends from, from uni. We've had to be very intentional. This is over 20 something years. We've had to be very intentional about just sustaining that relationship. You know, so sometimes we'll be on calls, somebody will be cooking, somebody else is working, endless video calls, like the four of us, we're just there, you know. Someone will taste the stew and make a comment online, you know, on the call and things like that. But we've had to be intentional because we realize that, and we're in different parts of the world, we realize that to keep this friendship alive is beyond just putting up a message on Instagram, hi, bye, you know, or liking somebody's post. Because that's how a lot of us connect in our world now. But I've said that to say, look, regardless of the things that are going on, the mandate is very clear. We follow Jesus till the end. We follow him all the way. So, people exit following Jesus for different reasons. One, you, you, you hear, okay, before I get to the reasons, let me give you some of the examples of how people just exit following Jesus. We exit following Jesus by stopping, uh, we, we, we see he's coming to church. COVID happened, and a number of us just refused to come to church anymore. Because all of a sudden, it just didn't seem as important anymore to engage with other believers, to enjoy that corporate, you know, gathering. Some people exit following Jesus by stopping spiritual disciplines, especially when they've experienced maybe loss, maybe grief. You know, there's stuff that has happened. And so you don't pray anymore. You don't fast anymore. You don't read God's word anymore. Why? You feel like he failed you at a particular point in time. Some of us have exited following Jesus, you know, from broken hearts. We've experienced rejection. I'm like, God, why did this happen to me? What were you looking at when it happened? And I don't belittle your pain. Please hear me clearly. Because we've been there, done that. I've had to question a couple things myself in the course of my work with him. When my dad died, I knew to do Everything that was in the book. In fact, I believed that he wasn't going to die. I felt so strong that I received a word. And yet, he, he died. And for the longest, I just sat there, just numb, just confused. Like, my God. I prayed now. I fasted. I laid hands. I anointed him. Day and night, I'm at his bedside declaring the word. Where did I miss it? And God said, it's, it's not about you. It was never about you in the first place. And it's such a hard pill to swallow for believers, right? But God is calling us to new levels of maturity. You know, I spoke about new life. A number of us, God is calling us to new levels of maturity where we will be sold out completely. We will believe him. We will believe in his sovereignty regardless of what comes at us. Let me talk about those four things very quickly and I would use that opportunity to break them down. Um, I will touch on them and then in the coming weeks as we start the new teaching series, we would expound further on each of these four things. Number one is temptation. The first exit point that is very common to a lot of us is temptation. Here is where you are following Jesus. But then temptation hits, right? And we succumb to it. And then we believe that we're unable to effectively follow him. Maybe guilt, sin, shame, whatever, just sets in. And we kind of lock the door behind it. And we just stay in that place where we allow those temptations to give way. Scripture says in the book of James that desire would, you know, have its full course, become sin. And when sin is fully grown, what happens? It leads to death. And that death is a spiritual separation from God, which is the devil's intention anyway. A lot of us are dealing with different types of temptation. I will not lie to you people who know that I don't have shame. 
I won't lie to you and stay here and tell you that, oh, I've never been there. It is a lie. I have been there very well. Different things. I remember one time, I think it was during Bible study. You know, there are certain types of temptation that come your way and it's not, you don't even recognize it as a temptation. Why? Because it's not a desire that you have. But there are other things that come that it hits you. You know, ah, if I'm not grounded, if I'm not rooted in God, if I, in fact, you see it, the appearance of it, you should seek help. But a lot of us just believe it's okay, you know, we embrace it, we rub it on its head, till it becomes something else. It becomes something else. Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able and someone needs to behold that word. Right now, you feel like, oh, I'm dealing, I can't even hold myself, I can't control myself. When I see a girl, you know, everything just, this is for the guys. Everything just feels like really crazy, etc, etc. You will not be tempted beyond what you are able. It means that there is a grace to overcome it. And we as believers, this scripture was not given to the unbelievers, oh. This scripture was for believers. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. God is faithful. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But with the temptation, he would also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. There is nothing that comes at us that we have not been given the grace to bear. We always just need to make a decision. We lie or we lie not. Am I aware of the grace that has been made available am i do i recognize god's faithfulness even in the face of this temptation and it is different things for different people for some of you eh, or let me not say you some of us your temptation is not one million naira it's not to add one zero to ten thousand naira it becomes hundred thousand that's not that's not your kind of temptation that one you look away the devil has nothing on you in that area but you get to a certain situation and you are the, the bills are staring you in the face and it is good money. And your faith is being called to question. And you're like, ah, God, maybe, the, maybe this is a, an opportunity you have just provided. You know, have you guys heard of people say things like, it's an opportunity for me to come and be light there. We even now excuse it. We say, you know, uh, there's so much darkness there. Let me just enter there. Let me enter their mist, you know, so that my light can shine. What happens is that their darkness overwhelms your little light. And you get lost in there. It's different things for different people. You know what? Because we're largely a church of young people. And I know that there's quite a number of unmarried people. I say to, I say to, the, to the young men I have an opportunity of just doing life with. I say things like, if at your single age, yeah, or your single state, let me put state, not age. You are still dealing with, you have one babe for Monday one babe for Tuesday, one babe for Wednesday, one babe for Thursday. Then you come here, you lift up holy hands, and you expect that you will have a good marriage. You have trained yourself to embrace certain unhealthy appetites. And it will always show up. It will always. Because you have not learned to put your body under. You have not learned to die to self. You have responded to the cravings of the flesh always. And it goes for the women as well. This is not just for, it's not just for the men. For the women as well, unhealthy appetites, unhealthy ambitions, the desire for the approval of men. I will, I will, I will touch on that in my second point. But it's just so many things. The temptation, temptation is the devil's attempt at just tripping us up every time. Because he knows that once I trip up a believer, guess what happens? He starts to feel guilty. And as the longer he stays in that place of guilt and condemnation, the easier it is for me to mess with his mind, to say you, you are not worthy now. It's not your type you are looking for in church. You, you want to serve God. How? You that you are still thinking about that girl. You have undressed her in your mind. You that you are a certain way. You that they asked, your boss asked you a question yesterday. And the first thing that came out of you was a lie. You. And it is so many things for so many people. Just different things across board. Jesus would have a discussion with Peter. Says the devil has sought to derail your faith, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. This is Luke twenty-two thirty-two. 32. 
But scripture gives us a, a, a confidence and an assurance in Hebrews 4.15. Like Jesus, we will be tempted. Scripture says concerning him that he was tempted yet without sin. He was tempted yet he did not sin. And that scripture, you need to understand that it is not just a standard. It is also a model. It is an example to us of what is possible in God. That it is possible to experience temptation, but to not give in to it. To be able to respond with the word in the face of that temptation. To be broke, right? Like church rat type. Okay, did they still, did they still use that church rat analogy, right? Church mouse. Church mouse or church rat type brokenness. Yeah? And to be presented with a deal that you know if I take this deal, it will change the tra trajectory of my finances and my my children, my unborn children's financial situation. But we have to look in the face and say, this is not for me. To be able to walk away in your broke state, recognizing that this is not for me. For some of us, it is the unhealthy ambition, the desire to attain heights. And so you are made an offer at work. Your boss says, sleep with me. Nobody will know. It's just a one-time thing. That promotion you're looking for, it will come your way. Don't worry, I got you. And you have calculated it. If I become a senior banking officer, you know, from there I move on to a management executive. From there I move on to an assistant manager. And then I become a senior manager. And then I, a, a vice president. And you have calculated it in your mind. Let me just, you know, play to the gallery of the big boys in my, institute, in my industry. And God is saying to you, promotion does not come from the east or from the west. Promotion comes from me. I am the lifter up of your head. I am the lifter. I'm the one that would exalt you in business. I'm the one that would exalt you in the work of your hands, in your career. I'm the one that will promote you in that marriage. You know, I have moved from the face of worrying. Because I'll be very honest with you to say I was very worried at some point. Maybe sometime last year. And just praying, you know, for the young men around me, I have entered into peace. But I recognize that it is a function of them that know their God. As many as know their God will be strong in the face of every temptation. Someone was telling me about a conversation they were having at the club, you know, with older men. And some of the married men here who are older, maybe you, you, you can speak to this for us. But just the mindset and the disposition that... At a certain time, I'm talking, these are men that are in their seventies, right? How old are you, sir? <laughs> your, your journey is just starting. But these are men that are in their seventies, their late sixties, and they were very comfortably telling this my friend who who, who is in his mid forties that oh you don't worry it's because you're just starting. Your journey is still far. That there is a mutual understanding that you get into after a certain age. You don't even it's not a conversation. That your wife knows that you are allowed to have younger girls outside. Yes, it's a thing. Like it's a whole thing. He says, because what is a 70-something-year-old man doing with a 70-something-year-old woman? And it appears as though as men age, they are, I think we have, young, we have younger people in the room. That drive, <laughs> that drive continues to increase. And so, that the women are unable to, so it's, a, it's an understanding. And I said, that is from the pit of hell. That is an understanding, an agenda that has been sponsored by the devil. And that the women are comfortable with it, you know. That they don't even bother, they look away. As long as the man comes home, as long as he picks the bills, they are okay. That is not the marriage that God designed. But I realize that it starts with when you're young. Nobody sells you an agenda that you are not open to. What, what are you doing from now? Who are you from now? Who are you becoming? What kinds of investments are you and I making into ourselves for our future? What word is in us? And so these things, how do we navigate this whole temptation conversation. Let me just say one point here. Like I said, we'll talk in a great deal about temptation in the coming days, or next week actually. It says we need to leverage the power of community. And that's why we have things like life groups. My question to you, Anna, is 
who is in your tribe? Who is in your squad? Yeah? Scripture says in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12, the New Living Translation, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person fails, the other can reach out and help. But someone who fails alone is in real trouble. You know, and it goes on and on and speaks about people, you know, lying together. One person gives warmth and all. But the question here is, who are you surrounding yourself with? Who am I surrounding myself with? Am I surrounding myself with people that only speak about the gloom and the doom that exists in our world today? Or have I surrounded my people, myself with people who are... And I don't want us to be shallow, right? We live in this world, but we are not of this world. The same way I can read the business news, you know, and I can appropriate the information there. But there is a stronger mindset that I have that I recognize that it's not the exchange rate volatility that determines the quality of my life. So I might be interacting with that information, but the information has nothing on me. That is where we need to get to. You are engaging with that business partner that has rejected you and has said all sorts, you know, and you feel really broken and, 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 and all whatnot. That relationship that they have called you something else, you've had to quit it, you had hoped to get married, but it, is, it, it didn't pan out that way. I engage with these realities, but it does not. I recognize that those outcomes do not determine the quality of my life because the word of God concerning me stands sure. That is the disposition we have been called to. So who is in your squad? I see all sorts on social media, the times that I am able to engage. Squad goals, sometimes it's cars for the men. Squad goals, it's chest, six pack. It's chest now, it's not chest, six packs. Squad goals, bearded gang. All, are, all, my, all my boys, you know, we all, we all have full beards, clean, healthy. I hear they spend a lot of money, man. Adrian, tell us. You say people spend a lot of money maintaining those beards. Squad goals for the women is travel companion. You know, today we are in Dubai, tomorrow. And those are the squad goals that we are aiming for. Where are your prayer squad goals? Where is the study of the word squad goals? That you are directly dividing the word of truth together. Your squad goals is Vera Wang that will design my wedding dress. Those are the kind of squad goals that some of us are still holding on to. Squad goals is, uh, what's that thing we do at reception these days? Please, when do the brides always have time to go and practice those dance steps? I look at these steps like... The people that are doing it, you put it, and I'm not, guys, hear me, oh. I am not saying these things are bad. Hear me well. They are very nice. They are nice to have. But I'm saying in the scale of priority, you become and dance the dance with your Ashwabi girls and your, this thing, your bridesmaids. What is in you to sustain the marriage? Are you a woman of prayer? Shekataliana Calling your husband's name and decreeing God's word on his head. Who are you? You are doing squad goals. Is it squad goals that is your problem now? Now, they are, they are healthy squad goals. Some people have, you know, tribes that they are financially, uh, you know, uh, literate. So you, you are putting money together. You are setting aside funds to do stuff. You know, some people have goals that you have friends, you are impacting the world. Those are great. But my point is, please surround yourself with people who will make you better. Not people who are selling the agenda of, you know, when men get older, it's okay to have a side chick. To have, you get to the clubs, you know, the Goi Club and the likes, you see all those small, small, small girls there with old men. And you are, who are you? Who are you? Let me ask the person beside, who are you? And who are you becoming? Who is in your tribe? What are your squad goals? Accountability keeps you strong. You need a community that can hold you accountable and keep you strong. Hebrews 12 says, we are what? We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Some of us, we are surrounded by weak people. We are not surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. We are surrounded by a great cloud of weak people, of vain people, of people that will lead you astray. It says we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. It says, therefore, we put aside everything that entangles. We put aside besetting sin. Why? Because those, those men of faith, men and women of faith, that cloud of witness, they are cheering you on. They are saying to you, we did it. We went through this. It did not overcome us. You can do it. 
But when you are surrounding yourself with people that you are, you people don't know any better, it's like the blind leading the blind. Let me give you guys an example in scripture. I think it's 2 Samuel 13. Let me look for it quickly. 2 Samuel, where's that story of uh, Amnon and Tamar? Amnon and, uh, you, Amnon is son of David. At some point, just unhealthy appetite. Began to desire his sister, his, step, his stepsister. Until he, he, he said, <laughs> he was becoming sick, such that he became visible to others. And his cousin asked him, Jonadab, he says, why are you getting things? Why is the son of the king getting things? See, you see that's how they used to confuse us. Even people in government, surrounding themselves with psychophants. God help me. Let me stay with the message. Jonah Dab shows up and says, why is the son of the king getting thinner and thinner? Making him feel more important than he was. If he had a friend that would set his head, what's wrong with you? You want to sleep with your sister? Are you, are you okay? Are there not other women? Are you not the son of the king? Can't you go and marry? Do you understand? This one says to him, you know what? <laughs> this, that's your problem? Is that all? Is there more? That's all. Uh -uh. Easy. Just tell your father that you're not feeling well. Lie down and pretend to be ill. This is, I'm not faking this story. It's in scripture. Second Samuel, I think it's 13 or so. Uh -huh. He says, go and find, tell, tell your father that you're not feeling well. And that is your sister. That one that you want, that, that you are desiring. Let her come and attend to you. She should come and cook for you. And tell your father that you want to. Ah, hell. May God make us discerning as parents in Jesus' name. May God separate every Jonadab from our children, from us. I know that some of you say, well, I'm not even there yet, so I'm thinking about children. So may the Lord separate Jonadab from you in Jesus' name. May the Lord turn the counsel of the Jonadabs in your life into foolishness in Jesus' name. This guy tells the king's son a whole royalty. And he follows the plan to the T. Sleeps with his sister. Finishes the act. Hates her for it. And you know what is painful? Is that the guy, this Jonadab, goes undiscovered. If you read further down in 2 Samuel 13, you will see that he's the same one I went and met the king. How do you not know such craftiness exists? May you be discerning in Jesus' name. The guy goes and tells the king that, ah, this guy, oh, he's planned Absalom. The brother of Tamar is planning this thing. You know, he's, he, 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 he has not killed all the king's son. He's only Amnon. Do you, you that put the Amnon in trouble. May the places where you have, you know, sought help and counsel that has led you. May the Lord deliver you from the effects of such wrong counsel in Jesus' name. That's Jonadab squad. May the Lord give you good and godly friends in Jesus' name. And I say this prayer with all my heart. You see, because the days ahead are evil. The days ahead are getting darker and darker. But may the Lord help us be planted. And not only will we find the people of like minds who would enable us on this journey, support us, but we would also become those types of friends that can support and hold people's hand and say, no, that counsel is not of God. This is the way. Stay there. I know it is tough. I know it is hard. I know the pressure is real, but you can do this. I'm cheering you on. I'm praying for you. I'm lifting you up in the place of prayer. That we will be the friends whose faith will carry those in need. Our friends that are in need. You know, it was the faith of Jesus that carried Peter on that water. It was the faith of Jesus. Jesus had done the work. And so when Jesus said to him to come, he only needed to believe. But when he began to look around, as some of us are doing in this day and age, we are looking at the exchange rates. We are looking at what the government policies that are coming and affecting businesses. We are looking at things. And Peter had to cry out, help me. Let me run. We'll, do, we'll deep dive further on temptation. Don't miss church. We'll tell someone, don't miss church in March. Don't miss church in March. Second thing is needs and cares. Needs and cares. Guys, please give me an additional 10 minutes so I can wrap up. Needs and cares of this world. Mark 4, 18 to 19 says, Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, one, the deceitfulness of riches, two, and the desire for other things entering in chokes the word and it becomes unfruitful. Our needs and our cares. And they are so varied. Again, this, we don't have time to deep dive. But in this generation, the need for the approval of men is such a big deal. The need for men pleasing, that they would, you know, they would see me, they would, if I don't give them, how would they take it? 
I'm not, you know, if I don't show up, I need to, you know, because we want to impress. We want to be seen a certain way. Popular culture has defined how to exist for us, and we have embraced it. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's not okay to be woke, you know, but when you are woke and the wokeness has carried you out of following Jesus, to what end is your wokeness? No, let's, let's be real. Nobody's saying don't look good. Nobody's saying don't dress the part. Nobody's saying don't speak the language if it is healthy. But when your definition of, of wokeness has separated you completely from the love of Christ, then there's a problem. Can I speak to my ladies? You see, I don't understand what people are doing with Ashwa B these days. Because sometimes I wonder if it is a quarter of a yard or a tenth of a yard that is being sold as Ashwa B these days. It baffles me. Why must you reveal the parts of the body that should be kept private? Demand that you use the to, to attract the cleavage. You will need it to sustain him more. And I will, I, you, you, you might say it's okay. Uh, you are there. Why are you there? But guess what? Did they get tired of listing your own? You go and find another person's own to be looking at. That cannot be the way. And I know that it sounds really funny, but that can be the way. Surely, there is a better way. You can look good without revealing nothing. It's very possible. I would like to have a clothing line at some point, if my busy nature would allow. I'm serious. You can, you can look good. You don't have to dress the way everybody's dressing. Sometimes I look at the things we wear, especially at wedding parties, and I'm just like... <sighs> you know, and while it is that I'm not excusing the men, because I, I've heard people say things like, ah, man, the way the, we, these women are even dressing up and behaving, you know. I've heard people fall into temptation and, like, and they blame it on the woman. I'm like, you're a very stupid man. <laughs> because you have, not, you, you have a problem. You have not disciplined yourself to be able to look away. If they are putting it all in your face, it must you look? <laughs> and if you, if, you, if you, how do you say, if you look, must you see? Or if you see, must you? You, just... <laughs> you need to unlook. Some of us is going to wash our eyes when we get home. Because all the things you have seen have scattered your brain. I'm serious. Hey, can I be real? You know, there are certain things, I, I think sometimes we underestimate the power that we have. You know, it's okay to, I was in a conversation with someone, very strange. I was in a conversation with a man, and I happened to walk into that conversation, and there was a lady in front of him, and she had a button undone quite a bit. And I knew that it wasn't because I stepped in, was why the man, he, he didn't switch, because the conversation was already ongoing. There's something it's called. I can't remember the phrase he used. And it's like, why are you, why are you trying to? He didn't say, he didn't say, why are you trying to tempt me or why are you trying to, to make me fall? He said, why are you? I've forgotten the phrase. He used the phrase then, back in the days. More like it sounded like, what are you trying to do? Why are you? Why are you? Do, why are you even doing this? Some of us lack the boldness and the courage to call out things, to call it out. So, you know, and it's not about the person. You know, sometimes some people are even unconscious of the things that they are doing. There's a spirit at work. The same way to in marriage, sometimes your spouse will behave like a knucklehead. And you would think that, yeah, <laughs> I've heard people say things like, my, my, my husband is possessed or my wife is possessed. There's a spirit at work. You don't address the individual. It's the spirit at work you address. And sometimes when you call out, it's not just for your own salvation, also for the salvation of the person. But we become very accepting in our world. And I'm not saying go around and start to use a hammer to be knocking down people. In life point here, we say come as you are. And it's okay. Come as you are because we know that you will not remain the way you are. You will not. Certain things will become deprioritized. If you came and all you were concerned about was just my hot body. By the time the Lord is done with you, heaven is your goal, not your hot body. So we say come as you are. Come as you are, because it's important to God that you be transformed into the image of his son. And it's so many things that we've become accepting of. 
Even if you can't address the individual, when you get into your prayer closet, what are you saying to God? What are you talking about? The need for approval of men, people pleasing, the need for acceptance, what popular culture is defining, you know, wokeness, FOMO, loss of identity. I forgot to open the other, these things, see me an analogy. It is well. You know, ah, there are people locked it. We refuse. <laughs> they don't want us to be, to, to, to fall away by the needs and the cares of this world. But that second exit is the needs. And for some of us, temptation is not it. It is the needs and the cares of this world that is the issue. How will my business thrive? How will I grow? Who will I marry? They say men is now, the ratio is now seven women to one man. Is there still any man? Men are scum. You know, women are this. There's just so much. The needs and the cares, the deceitfulness of riches, the need to satisfy the cravings and the desires of the flesh, unhealthy ambitions, doing things at any cost. Am I following Jesus because of my needs? You know, some of us started out that way. You had a need and you came to, to the cross. Your heart got broken and you remembered Jesus. You showed up and he embraced you, he received you. Now that you have married, we don't see you in church again. The Lord has done it. <laughs> Finally. Before when you came, it was God when. Now the Lord has done it. It's Finally, we are not seeing you again. Prayer, you don't used to pray anymore. Read the Bible. The, the giver of the gift all of a sudden has been forgotten. We have now held on to the gift. Ah, you know I have to make my home. You know I need to ensure that my husband is satisfied so that he does not look out. Hey! May you not labor foolishly. If you think that it is by your doings. I mean, that's not excusing the things that you need to do as an individual. Please, hear me well. You have responsibilities under God as an individual. But to think... That it is what you do that will preserve the gifts that God has given. Absolutely not. That's faulty thinking. That is faulty thinking. And so we see all these things. Am I following Jesus? Some people followed Jesus for bread. And it's okay. Jesus fed them. He recognized that they were hungry. He did not withhold from them. The same way he will not withhold from us. What will I eat? What will I drink? What will I wear? What can choke the development of my faith? What should I do when it seems like God is focused on other things but my needs? It looks like God is not answering me. I've come to tell him that I need this, I need that, but it just seems like I'm not getting what I need from him. The disciples were in a similar state in Mark 4, 39. And they asked, don't you care, Lord, that we perish? How can we be in need and you are sleeping? And I feel like that's the mentality some of us have towards God. God, you see me suffering like this. Am I a cockroach? Am I, what, what are all those things that you people normally say? Am I a this? Am I a that? You see me dealing with all these things. And you are, you know, Jesus was sleeping there. Like, God, are you sleeping? Let me remind you what he says in Matthew 6, 31. He says, so don't worry about these things. Saying what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. New Living Translation. These are the things that dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Essentially saying that there is a thinking that you and I as believers need to embrace. That is very different from that which the world embraces. Because that is what they think after. And what does he say to us in response to our needs and our cares? He says, seek first the what? And every other thing. All these things that you're looking for will be added. It's an addition. It's an addition. Scripture says to fix your eyes on the things above. Your mind can only accommodate one place per time. What we're trying to do in our generation is to fix our eyes above and to fix our eyes on the earth. You have to choose one. Hello, sir. It's only one. Fix your eyes on things above. Store up for yourself, lay up for yourself treasures in where? Heavenly places. Where moth and rust do not destroy. What we're trying to do is lay up treasure for you. You will expend energy and strength where your treasure is because that's where your heart is. So where is your heart? Where is your heart? Are your eyes fixed on the things above or fixed on the eternal uh, or, or fixed on the temporal things, the transient things? We hustle a lot in our world, in our generation for things that are very ephemeral and we are not laying up for ourselves treasure in heavenly places. 
the place that matters the most. Because this marks, you will do what? 120 years. And there's an agenda to say, at last, last, everybody will die. It's something that will kill everybody, you know. We are finding people in our generation just even become more accepting of the thought of, it's okay, as long as I'm with my squad in hell, it's all right. We do life together. <laughs> May the Lord deliver you from hell and eternal damnation in Jesus' name. The third point, quickly, persecution and tribulations. This one is hard meat, and we're going to deep dive it. You see, because this is one question that I know young people always ask. We want to enjoy the benefits of a God without the suffering. <laughs> I hate to break it to you. That's not how it works. That's not how it is. Jesus says that in this world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome for you. But that's not enough for us. We don't even want the smell or the appearance of a tribulation and a persecution. Scripture says in Mark 4, these likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, verse 16, who when they hear the word immediately receive it with gladness. They have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Persecution and tribulation sometimes appears in the form of the thing that you're trusting God for and it just doesn't show. It appears for the word's sake, who you believe, who you stand for. You've been vocal about your faith. God will do it. And people are asking, where is your God? How many people have been in that situation? Where you're trusting God for something like that, and you have been very vocal about it, and my God will do it. My God will do it. Oh, when, you're, when my dad died. Uh -uh, pastor, but you prayed. Abby, you did not pray. Why didn't God answer us? And different things. People will call you out on the things that you believe. They would ask you to defend your hope, the hope that you have, as seen in scripture. Different things. How do we respond to persecution that arises for the word's sake? Paul was beaten. Daniel was thrown in the lion's den. The three Hebrew boys experienced fire. How do we respond for the word's sake? People will dig up dirt. They will go and dig up your past. You say you are Jesus' baby. This is who you were. This is what you used to do. This is what is the confidence that you have? What is the assured hope that you have? The church must expect persecution and tribulation. Otherwise, the church is conforming. If, you're not, if you've not experienced any persecution on your journey, you need to check your light. Is it really shiny? Because it is a given. Jesus already said it. You see, this, in, this light, in this world filled with gross darkness, a lot of people will be offended by your light. And that's okay. But it doesn't then mean, please, we have opened this one already. It doesn't mean that we conform. It doesn't mean that because we're persecuted and we're experiencing trials and tribulations, that we stop following Jesus. We just exit. This is an exit. That's the way to go with Jesus. Temptations have taken some people to exit. The needs and the cares of this world, some people have exited. Now, persecution and trials, like, no, this is not for me. Soft life. Soft life gang. I'm not here for suffering. Jesus, if this is the only thing, it's okay, I've tried now. I'm, I don't want this suffering. In all of it, Jesus says to us, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you and I need to be able to be confident in that word, be confident in that assurance. He has not called the house of Jacob to seek him in vain. He has not called you to seek him in vain. And so if he says that I will never leave you or forsake you, in every situation you need to believe it with all your heart. James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So I need to note down Isaiah 43 verses 2 to 4 as a promise that you will read it up and you appropriate it to yourself. Lastly, contradictions, delays, and changing seasons. Contradictions, delay, and changing seasons. Okay, this one too doesn't want to open. But you get the picture, right? That's another exit point. Contradictions, delays, and changing seasons. Hebrews 10, 35 says, Therefore do not cast away your confidence which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. 
What we are doing in our generation is that we are casting it away. We are giving up too quickly. We are saying it's not worth it. Must my life be this way? I see other people who are not following Jesus and their lives, their lives are turning out well. Who says? Because they have some money? Because they make the news? They are famous? Are these the things that you desire as well? The devil gives it. He gives it and he gives it well. But if you know that you have been called, you've been chosen, you have been elected according to God's purpose, according to his divine ordination, then you know that it is not by looking and, and comparing the things that are happening in the lives of others with yours. Being confident in him that has called you. It says that confidence has great reward. When we have need of endurance, it says for yet a little while, he who is coming will come and will not tarry. The just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And then when you go on, he says, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. We are not of them that draw back. Help me tell someone, we don't draw back. We follow Jesus all the way. We go with him to the ends of the earth. We go with him till he returns. We don't draw back. Circumstances may present a contradiction to his word. Delays may suggest that God is unwilling or unable to do, your, to, to do what it is you're trusting him from. Changing seasons. You had it good and then something happens and changes the trajectory of your life. And then you start to question, is God real? Is God real? You know one of the things that hit me the most, and I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm wrapping up now. One of the things that hit, hit me you know, quite strongly just a couple years back was the guy who wrote, uh, I don't remember his full name now. But he wrote a book that a lot of us grew up reading. Is it purity something? Purity practice or purity principle or something like that. I forgot the name of the book. Purity something. And then all of a sudden, you, <laughs> he came out to say, oh, he, he's sorry for writing that book. Book that we had rightly divided. Book that was solid. It dipped right in God's word. Woke up one day and said, say, I'm apologizing to the LGBTQ community, you know. All of a sudden, just began to change his, his disposition. And says, oh no, that book was an error. And so many people are falling away. It's not about how long you have been saved. It is what roots have you grown. What is the quality of the light that is in you? Just like Jesus would say, is the light in you darkness? A lot of people are conforming. The pressures have come now to those roots. And it's taking people away. We are not of them that draw back. We are not of them that draw back. In it all, Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What causes men to deny Jesus? Sometimes lack of encounters and continued revelations of Jesus. Encounters reinforce our faith in God. Ah, God gave us a word last year and said, this year, we would have, to the last quarter of last year, we, it will be a year of encounters. And it has been my heart cry for everyone who engages life point that you would experience God like never before. You would have encounters, encounter of, encounters of his love where nobody can take from. You know when you experience something firsthand, nobody can come and tell you that it's not so. It's not the faith of your parents that you are living on. It's not even the faith of your pastor. It is the faith that you have developed by reason of being with him, by reason of encountering him, experiencing him. And I pray that you would enjoy encounters in this season. Because your encounters reinforce faith. Continued revelation of, of Jesus. It clears doubt. Can we hold hands as we pray? As we pray. Mashutali brother gado no shate. This season, as we prepare to celebrate the death and the resurrection of Christ, we need to open our hearts to hear the call of God upon our lives. And it is a call of love. It is a call to restoration. It is a call to encounters. It is a call to reassure us that in this world, he is with us. It is a call to remind us of the great cloud of witnesses that are cheering us on. And you know, a lot of us will become fathers and mothers. What faith do we want to hand down? If we don't even know it, if we don't even have it for ourselves. 
What do we want to give to our children? The scripture speaks about Timothy and it traces the faith from his grandmother to his mother and then to him. Where are the fathers? Where are the fathers? Oh, that men would arise in this season and they will man their gates. They will take their place as priests over their homes. And it starts from now. You don't have to wait till you are in a relationship or till you are married. What kind of man are you becoming? What kind of father are you becoming? That we will take our places as women, as men, as believers, as children of God. That nothing will separate us from the love. That's what you're declaring over the people you're holding. Nothing is permitted to separate you from the love of God in this season. Nothing is permitted. No one is permitted to take you away. Not your needs and your cares. Not persecution and tribulations. Not temptation. Not contradictions. Not a crisis of faith. Not delay. Not changing seasons. Your needs may have brought you to Jesus. But a greater need will not take you away from him in Jesus' name. That we will become people that are hungry. People who remain. People who are deeply rooted. Go ahead and just pray over the person that you're holding. Just sow that seed of prayer and say, Lord, help my brother. Help my sister in this season. Let nothing distract And let nothing deter him from following you. Let nothing stop her from being all that you have called her to be. Would you pray for yourself and say, Lord, help me. And it's a very simple prayer. I've been at crossroads in my life where all I knew to say was, Lord, help me. Help this child of yours. Help me. And someone needs to cry out this morning, Father, help me. There are too many things that have painted the wrong pictures in my mind that have caused me to question the quality of your love and your fatherhood. But today I ask, help me. I ask you, help me. That the Holy Spirit will begin to print fresh pictures over our hearts in the name of Jesus. That it will begin to paint that which is on the Father's heart over your heart. Over the works of your hands. The very thing that the enemy is trying to use to sow the seeds of doubt in you. That the Lord will give you a word. You will have a dream. You will see a vision. Someone will give you a word. You will know in your heart that indeed God is with me. And just as he has promised, he will never leave me nor forsake me. Thank you, our Father and our God. We give you praise. I just want to pray with anyone was here it starts with the relationship with Jesus you may have gone behind you may have exited from following him you used to know him but any of these things and maybe even other things we haven't touched on today have caused you to you know exit Jesus says behold I stand at the door and I knock he's knocking on the door of your heart this morning if that is you and you want to surrender your heart to him afresh You want to say, Lord, I'm coming back. My needs and my cares took me away from you, but I return today. Distraction, delays, changing seasons. A crisis of faith took me away from you, but I'm here today. If that is you, would you go ahead and put that hand up? Put it up. And if you are online, just go ahead. And indicate in the chat room, I just want to pray with you. I'm asking you to put that hand up so that we can journey with you. You need a new squad. You need a new team, a new community of people that will strengthen and help you in this walk of faith. So if that is you, just go ahead and raise that hand and I will take a prayer. Please repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you today. I acknowledge my need for you. I confess my sins. Just as your word says, that if I confess my sin, you are able, you are faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from every unrighteousness. And so today, in response to that word, I acknowledge my need for you and I say, forgive me. Holy Spirit, come into my heart and make your home with me. Help me live the life that God has called me to. Let the things that have separated me from Jesus Let me receive newness in them. Let these pressures, this pain, this grief that has caused me to doubt the quality of your love 
and your presence in and around me. Today, I ask that you will provide comfort over them. You would send help. You will provide solutions. Lord, we commend everyone who said this prayer into your hands and to the word of your grace that is able to build them and to give them an inheritance among the saints. We say, Father, that you will preserve. You will keep these ones from falling. You will teach and you will walk with them. In Jesus' name. I want to pray for someone here. You've heard it all and there's a specific need that has, you've, you've doubled into things you shouldn't have. You've doubled into things and you can't, for some weird reason, you really can't uh, either raise your hand or pray out loud. I pray that the mercy of God will locate you where you are in Jesus' name. If you do need someone to talk to, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. But I pray that the Lord will deliver you completely and he will set you free from the shackles that have held you down. You feel like you have gone too far to turn back. But that is a lie from the pit of hell. You just need to determine that today an end has come. It will be a painful exit. It will be a painful exit because you're locked in. But the Lord is able to deliver you. The Lord is able to retrieve the prey from the captives of the, of the mighty. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed and agreed. Amen and amen and amen. Go ahead and give Jesus a big hand. He's faithful.